I wonder how you got through lockdown. I wonder what you spent your time doing in lockdown. Were you one of those people who had enough spare time to pick up a new skill in those months stuck at home? All kinds of crazes caught on, didn't they? People started baking their own bread. People got rid of cross-stitch or sewing for the first time. Loads of people downloaded Duolingo because they thought, I might as well learn a new language. Maybe your lockdown experience was much more chaotic than that. Maybe the key skill that you learned in lockdown was how to simultaneously take a work phone call and change a nappy. Because for many, that was their experience. Almost all of us in lockdown had to learn new skills when it came to the area of technology. We were filled with the wonder of all that technology could achieve. And we are also deeply aware of the insufficiency of technology how much better it is to be in person with one another rather than just interacting through a screen. As I reflect on COVID times, I learned a bunch of new skills. I learned some new tech. I learned new terminology like R number. But more than that, one of the big things that that period taught me was that we have much less control than we like to think. We have much control than we like to think. All of a sudden, our plans became provisional. They became provisional based on the whims of a microscopic pathogen. I don't know if you're paying attention to the COVID inquiry going on in government at the moment, or whether that's the kind of thing that just makes your eyes roll. One of the things that's really fascinating as you listen to all these people giving evidence is that so many of them are working from the same basic assumption. And the basic assumption is this. We could and should have been able to stop this. We as humans are in control. So if we planned better, if we'd worked harder, if we'd made better decisions, we could have stopped it. Because we as humans are in control. And yet over those months of lockdown, nothing felt further from the truth, did it? We would often end up having to say things like, yeah, I'd love to see you virus dependent. Or COVID willing, yeah, I will see you later in the summer. Or yeah, let, let's hang out then if we aren't in lockdown again. We realized that we weren't in ultimate control. And what those months reminded me is actually that's always true. That is always true, not because a virus is ultimately in control of our world because a sovereign God is. As humans, we are not ultimate. God is ultimate. Increasingly, over those months of lockdown, I learned to see my life as dependent, my plans as dependent on God and on his plans. And yet, the human heart is foolish and deceitful, isn't it? As I look at my heart, 18 months or so after the kind of lockdown season has finished, all of the lessons, pretty much, that I learned in those 18 months are fading away. As I try again in my foolishness to convince myself that I really am in control, that I am in charge. And it's that kind of attitude that James wants to tackle in our hearts this morning, as he shows us two different approaches to planning. And the first approach he shows us, the one to avoid, is do not arrogantly assert your plans. Do not arrogantly assert your plans. See, James starts uh, his section here by introducing us to an imaginary character. It feels like, again, James has learned from Jesus in the way he teaches. Because what do we know about most of Jesus' most memorable stories, most memorable lessons? They were an imaginary person. They were a parable of some kind. Those often stick with us. And here James gives us an imaginary person. He presents to us a man, a businessman, a businessman with a business plan. Let me read you his plan. Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend the year there, carry on business and make money. James is going to say there's a problem with this man. The problem isn't that he has a plan. No, planning is a good and right thing to do. If we're to steward our lives and our resources well, we are to plan James isn't arguing that we kind of be those kind of people who are completely laid back, 
just let life hit us and do everything last minute. The issue isn't that he has a plan. The issue isn't even the content of the plan. It's not that James is saying it's wrong to be in business. We see Jesus commending those who invest their talent wisely for a return. Business isn't wrong. Profit isn't wrong. The issue isn't that he has a plan. The issue isn't the content of the plan. The issue is the certainty with which he plans. Did you notice that? Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. We will spend a year there. We will carry on business. We will make money. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. Utter certainty. He's planned it out. I wonder if you're the kind of person who maps out your life. Maybe you're a teenager and you've kind of got life ahead of you and you're starting to map it out. Maybe you remember back to when you were a teenager and you, that roadmap that you'd set for yourself. It's a particular issue if you're really driven and ambitious. You work out a plan for your life and then you gear everything around that plan. So you think, I'll, I'll do these subjects, I'll get these grades, I'll go to this university, I'll get this job, I'll get married, I'll live in this kind of house, I'll have this many children, I'll retire at this age, and the life is planned out ahead of you. It's easy to make plans like that. It's easy to presume that we are in control of our lives. As the famous poem Invictus says, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That's the spirit of our age, isn't it? I'm in charge. I have control. James paints a picture of a man who has that kind of attitude. A man who is certain about his business plan. Maybe that's the area that this particularly gets you. Actually, if you still work, maybe you do have your kind of work-life plan mapped out. Either just the next step, you know where you want to go next, or you're the kind of person who's got the next 15 years in your mind. And your instinct is to presume that as long as you do it, as long as you do your bits, that plan is guaranteed to happen. It's certain, because you followed your plan. Maybe that's how you think. That is basically the air that we breathe. In our modern Western world, the assumption is that we are in control, and as long as we do our bit right, the results are guaranteed. We will get the outcome that we desire. Technological advancements make that illusion of control even more believable, because we are increasingly in control of so many more things than we were. And yet look what James reminds us in verse 14. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while, then vanishes. We think we're in total control, but we don't even know what will happen tomorrow, James says. We boastfully present our future plans as certain, but we don't even know what tomorrow will hold. I don't know what you're facing tomorrow. I don't know whether you're looking forward to tomorrow or whether tomorrow fills you with utter dread. Either way, what I'm pretty confident of is tomorrow will not go exactly as you imagine it. If you, if you were to now in your head map out exactly how you think tomorrow will go, something will be different. An unexpected phone call. The child in the classroom who acts completely differently for no apparent reason. The traffic jam you get stuck in that makes you late for a meeting. You just feel oddly tired and struggling to focus and can't get done what you thought you'd get done. Or something more significant, a diagnosis for you or a family member that you didn't see coming. An unexpected bill dropping through the post box that you cannot afford to pay. Or tomorrow might go way better than you're expecting. Either way, it will not go exactly as you've mapped it out. We don't know what will happen. We aren't in ultimate control. And yet we like to believe that we are. It's one of the reasons, actually, why quite a lot of people really struggle to adapt to parenthood. Because one of the challenges with becoming a parent is this illusion you have that you're in control of your diary gets completely shattered. And you don't quite know how to react to that. It takes a while to adjust to that reality. We are not in ultimate control. 
Instead, James says, what is your life? A mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. It's something that we struggle to get our heads around, this idea that our life is just a mist. I think in part that's because we can't really imagine this world without us. That's fairly understandable, given that we will never experience this world without us. We weren't here before we were born. We won't be here after we die. We only know this world with us in it. But actually, for all of us, unless Jesus returns first, there will be a time in the future where this world will keep spinning and we won't be part of it anymore. Our life is a mist. When you're young, the end of life, it just feels so far away. There's so much life left to be lived. When you're older, life can just feel like it's been going on for ages. It doesn't really feel like a mist at all. And yet, in the grand sweep of history, what is the 60, 70, 80, 90, 95 years that the Lord gives you? if he gives that many. They are like the morning mist. They're there for a while, and then gone, vanishing, and in time, forgotten. I won't get you to put your hands up, but I wonder how many of you could name all of your great-grandparents. My guess is not very many, and my guess is if any of you can, you almost certainly can't name everyone a generation back from that in your family. Even within our own families, it doesn't take that long for us to be forgotten. Our lives are a mist. They're lived once, they're over before we know it, and in due course, we will be forgotten. And so it's foolish to assert our plans as if we're in control, as if we're in charge, as if we have the power, because we clearly don't. Just think of the parable that Jesus told of that rich fool, the one who spent his life making sure he had enough for the future, building bigger and bigger barns to store all his stuff so he was secure for the future. And then he finally got to the point of thinking, I've got enough now. I'm boasting in what I have. I can sit back. I can eat, drink, and be merry. And what does the Lord do in that story? That very night, he dies. What's the point? Don't think you're in control of your life. Don't think you can map it all out. Don't boast in your plans and your success, because ultimately you are not in control. Our best laid plans might come to nothing. We aren't the masters of our fates. We aren't the captains of our soul. It is foolish to think otherwise, James says. But actually, he goes one step further. It's not just foolish. James says it's evil. Look at verse 16. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. That might sound a bit over the top. I mean, sure, it's not great that, I'm in, that I think I'm in control, but, but evil? But the reason James says that is because he zeroes in on the heart attitude that sits behind it. As we've been working our way through James, if you've been with us over the last kind of couple of months or so, you're beginning to see that the attitude that James really wants to foster in us, it's an attitude that sees us as recipients and God as giver. And therefore, we are humble. Because we recognize that we're not in control. We recognize that things come to us as gift. This kind of attitude that says, I'm in control of my plans is exactly the opposite to everything that James has been driving towards. It's a pride that says, I don't need God's gifts. It's a heart that sets itself up against God because we think that we're in control, not him. And so it's not a surprise that James calls it evil because it is shifting the ultimate good out of the center of the universe and trying to put us there instead. It is, as James says, arrogant. And yet we all do it. We all, in different ways, like to think that we are in control. The kind of people that our society runs towards are the kind of people who talk like they're in control. James, again, is really countercultural. Who is it that people flock to often in our society? 
It's the visionary, the one who has it all mapped out in their heads, the one who you'll confidently follow because they know where they're going. But they don't know where they're going. None of us do. None of us ultimately even know what will happen tomorrow. I don't know what plans you are tempted to fix in your minds. Maybe it's plans for your own life. Maybe if you're a parent, actually the plans that you're more fixated on are your children's lives, as you've mapped out how you want their lives to go. Feel free to make plans. Feel free to have hopes. Feel free to have ambitions, James says. But don't assert them arrogantly. Don't think they are guaranteed to happen. Don't think that they're ultimately up to you, and as long as you do your thing properly, they're guaranteed to come to pass. Because they're not. Ultimately, we are not in control. We don't even know what will happen tomorrow, James says. That's the first approach to planning. Arrogantly asserting your plans, and James says, don't do that. Here's the second approach that he calls us to this morning. See that your plans depend on the Lord's will. See that your plans depend on the Lord's will. Let me read verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if. Two crucial letters. Two letters, when understood rightly, that completely change our perspective on life. I, F. If. Tiny word. Huge implications. Because all of a sudden, in that one word, all of life gets reorientated by two letters that shift us out of the center, that show us that we are no longer at the steering wheel, but life instead is conditional. It's not enough to just say if, because it depends what the condition is. So it's not enough to say if I, you know, if I get around to it, if I remember, if I get lucky, it still puts us in control. It's not enough to say if and then kind of assign it to some random impersonal force. You know, if fate allows me to, if destiny so be, so decides it. You know, James says, if the Lord wills it, there is another person involved, and he is in the driving seat. Some people speak of life as a kind of play. If you imagine life as a play for a moment... What role do you see yourself in? What role would you like to be in? What role do you like to convince yourself you are? My instinct is that all of us, in some way, shape, or form, we might not articulate it to one another, we might not even articulate it to ourselves, but in the way that we act and think, we all like to think we have two roles, the director and the lead actor. We like to be the director. We like to think that we are the one in control of everything. We like to think we're the lead actor because we like everything revolving around us to be in total control and at the center. That's how we like to think about life. We live in an if I will it kind of world. With the illusion of control, convincing ourselves that everything is in our hands. We're the director, we're the lead actor. And yet God says the complete opposite of that. In a sense, all of history is one big play. It's one complete story from beginning to end. It has a director. That director is God alone. He has his plans. He's come up with the plot. And they will come to fruition. The main character in that play is Jesus. Jesus is the one around all human history revolves. So that is so true that our whole dating system in the West revolves around him. History is effectively divided into two acts. It's a, it's a play of two acts. The hinge before them, between them, is the ba a baby being born. Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Son of God, who lived a life like no other, who died a death like no other, in perfect alignment with God's plan. The plan that God, Father, Son, and Spirit came up with before the world began where the son would come into the world to deal with the biggest problem in the world, the way that we all turn our backs on him. The son would come into the world, he would live a perfect life in human form, and he would die the death that people deserve. He would pay for their sins, and he would rise to new life. He would be lifted up into heaven, and one day he will come back to judge. 
and to take his people home to be with him. That's the plan. That's the plot. That's the main thread of the story. And it's not conditional on anything because it is the Lord's will. Jesus is the central character in human history. And yet, wonderfully, he chooses to weave us into the story. If you're here this morning and you're one of Jesus' people, this story, this big plan, this play, is working for your good, individually and together. You feature in the story, and you feature in the best bit of the story, because you're part of the happily ever after. The end of this play, that happily ever after moment, as Jesus takes his bride, the church, to be with him forevermore. You're part of that. That's where the story's heading. That's the plan. And this fundamental reorientation is necessary. If we're to live life well, if we're to live life as God calls us to live it, we need to see that our plans depend on the Lord's will. We aren't the central character. In fact, verse 15 reminds us it's not just our plans that are contingent on the Lord. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live. Verse 15. It's not just our plans, it's our very lives that are dependent on the Lord. In a sense, the most fundamental thing about your life is whether it's still going on or whether it's ended. That is in the Lord's hands not ours. Now, I don't know how you go about recording your plans. Are you a Google Calendar kind of person? Are you a wall diary, a kind of wall calendar in the kitchen type? Are you a paper diary lover? James has nothing to say about which of those is better. What he does want to speak about is your heart attitude as you use any one of those things. What is going on in those moments as we write or type? Do we write or type thinking it is whatever we put in there is certain to happen? Like it's some kind of magic moment where the minute you press complete or you finish writing the thing in your diary, it's guaranteed to come to pass. Or are we humble enough to recognize that yes, we make plans, but life isn't guaranteed. Our plans aren't guaranteed because we aren't the director God is. And so James says, we are to say, if it is the Lord's will. Not as some kind of talisman, not some kind of thoughtlessly churning out the phrase. Saying it, but not really meaning it. You might well have got into the habit of saying things like, God willing, or signing off emails, DV, which is kind of Latin for God willing. And that is a good thing to do. If it helps remind you that you are not at the center. If it just becomes something you say because you know you should, and your heart attitude isn't aligned with those words, you're saying the words, but you're not really living in light of them, it's pointless. What James wants is a heart attitude of submission. A heart attitude that humbly acknowledges life as one big gift from the Lord. That acknowledges that his will alone is ultimate. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're a planner. Someone who really likes to feel on top of stuff. Who hates it when the to-do list racks up. Who always wants to know what exactly is going to happen in the next week and how all those things are going to get done and when. If you're like that, words like this are a real challenge. They are to me. They might be to you. A challenge to that arrogant way of thinking that likes to think that we are in control. That we can guarantee that our outcomes happen. But these words are also a wonderful comfort to us. They're a comfort to us because it means that we know that nothing happens outside of the Lord's will. If it is the Lord's will, it will happen. So that shock diagnosis for you or a family member, it's the Lord's will. That letter or phone call bringing bad news is the Lord's will. Never getting that thing you'd always wanted. It's the Lord's will. Doesn't make those things painless. Doesn't make them easy to take. But how much better when those things come along to be able to process them as good gifts from a loving father 
than to see them as just randomly bestowed by the universe with no rhyme or reason. Your plans depend on the will of another, on the will of a loving father, on the will of a generous Lord who bestows every good gift on his people. So yes, make plans. I mean, we make plans. We've literally given you our plan for the next three months this morning, haven't we? Make plans. Plans for business, plans for holidays, plans for retirement, whatever it will be, do make plans. But have the right perspective as you make those plans. Recognize they are conditional on the will of another, subject to the Lord's will. James has set before us two distinct approaches this morning. One approach that arrogantly boasts of certainty, that thinks it is in control, that sees itself as the main actor and the director of the play. And another that recognizes our right place, that sees us under God's sovereign hand, unable to execute his, uh, our will, our plans, apart from his will. And he closes by calling us to live out what we've just heard. Look at verse 17. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. What's James saying? He's saying, you now know the good, so do it. And what he's particularly saying is it's not just enough to avoid the negative. You have to actively do the positive. So people who kind of, theologians, people who write books about these kind of things, they categorize sin into two distinct categories. Sins of commission and sins of omission. What does that actually mean? Sins of commission are, are sins we commit, bad things we do. But then there's also sins of omission, and that's the good things that we choose not to do. James here is concerned about sins of omission. That is, he is concerned that we don't just avoid point one, but that we also actively do point two. So it's not enough, James says, just to not arrogantly assert our plans. We have to actively recognize our plans are subject to the Lord's will. Whether that's by using the phrase, if the, it is the Lord's will, God willing, or whether that's by fostering the heart attitude another way. Will you this morning grow in that attitude? Will I grow in that attitude? Accepting that our plans are contingent, dependent on the Lord's will. Will we humbly accept what comes from his hand and honor him with whatever comes our way? Let me lead us in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you alone make plans. You alone have plans that are guaranteed to come to pass. Our plans are subject to yours. Please help us to see that, to recognize that. Please humble us, helping us to see that we are not the center point, but we are part of your great big story. Please, we draw comfort from knowing that your plans will come to pass. And please would we therefore see our plans as contingent on what you would see happen. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.